So I have the honor to chair this uh, session. Uh, I just say that um, introduce oh, yeah, yeah. Phil, who is the reason uh, uh, why we are all here. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, this is a talk that uh, Ruth and Sunny I uh, developed. I'm the one responsible for giving the talk. I'm going to step out of my role as the co-author first, and um, since I may not get another opportunity, give some thanks to various people. I have to thank Peter Fanaghi, the head of the uh, psychology and uh, linguistics section of UCL. Uh, those of you who heard his introduction uh, were probably as moved as I was by it, and he has been extraordinarily generous. It's the first conference I've ever been to where they're actually going to pay for alcoholic drinks for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so after that, I must thank the committee, uh, uh, Monica Bucciarelli, of course, mm -hmm. Uh, Marco Rani and Sonny, who seems to be doubling as the UCL technician. As well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then, of course, uh, I have to thank uh, Christina Quelhash for making this wonderful compilation uh, into a very nice book, which I think you all have access to. I haven't opened it yet. I fear that the damage to my ego is already too severe. <laughs> but my wife was fairly realistic, um, um, often damages my ego, tells me that I will survive. Uh, and there is the video, I don't know, I hope that the video might be made available uh, if you want to be reminded if you appear in it, uh, uh, the nice things you said about another human being. Uh, there, I could go on, but you haven't given me the Oscar, so I'm not going to go any further. Uh, I will, however, again, thank uh, Mo, my wife, because uh, she had a little hand in helping with the organization. All right, now I step back into my role as a co-author. Uh, if I say I, I mean we. And if I say we, I mean we. <laughs> okay, this may be my swan song, I don't know. Uh, you never can tell. Uh, so goodbye to logic. Um, I'm going to tell a story. We are going to tell a story. I'm the narrator. Uh, standard logic cannot underlie human reasoning. And um, the findings that I'm going to present, we are going to present, I'll learn it in a moment, uh, are examples, obviously, from a larger set of data. Um, the theory of the main phenomena of being simulated in computer programs, but we still haven't fit all the programs. Oh, sorry for the Americanism there. Uh, we still haven't fitted all the programs together into a single <laughs> uniform program with a nice interface. All right, so I'm going to say something about standard logic. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the room knows something about it, and there are some people in the room that know much more about it than I do. Uh, we define a standard logic as the sentential calculus, which is the calculus that deals with idealizations with fixed constant meanings of not, and, if, and, or, various predicate calculi which add uh, the logic of sum and all and other quantifiers eventually, modal logics which deal with possibility and necessity, of which there are countable infinity, and arithmetical logics. That is to say, if you look at the logic that uh, that Gödel used to prove the incompleteness, uh, his incompleteness theorem, namely that he, the logic couldn't capture all the truths of elementary arithmetic, that is also a standard logic. It's built on predicate calculus without modal logic. So I'm going to focus on, we are going to focus on two things in common. What they have in common, all of these logics. They use a semantics of true or false. And that defines the meaning of not, and, if, and, or, etc. I won't go beyond one example. Uh, there's a triangle or a circle, but not both on this side. That is true if one of them is present. Um, so since there isn't a triangle, uh, it's false, or a circle. And I'm going to also uh, argue that validity uh, that applies with a common definition with a few little bells and whistles. Uh, what this means 
is a conclusion is true in all cases in which the premises are true. In other words, there aren't any counterexamples in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. That too, we have to give up if we want to give an account, an accurate account of, of human reasoning. Uh, so let me now turn to mental models. You probably had enough <laughs> of them, uh, but let me mention what goes on in the most recent version. When you understand the meaning of there's a triangle or a circle, but not both, obviously what is in your head isn't just truth values, it may not be truth values at all. What you have are models of possibilities. Uh, you have intuitive models, so you, these are models that are constructed, as it were, on the fly rapidly, uh, without too much thought. One possibility is a triangle, another possibility is there's a circle. If you have to think about things a bit harder, you will represent not just what's true in each possibility, from the clauses in the premise, but also what's false. So you'll have deliberative models. So there's a triangle without a circle, or there's a circle without a triangle. I'm using a symbol with an L on its side just to stand for negation. Uh, <clears throat> what these two alternatives are is slightly different what you might expect if you're thinking in terms of truth tables. First, they are possibilities that hold in default of knowledge to the contrary. One of them, however, must hold if this disjunction is to be considered true. And moreover, they're in a conjunctive relation. So you've got the possibility of a triangle and the possibility of a circle. Suppose you learn that in fact there is a circle, then this possibility turns into being a fact. And the other possibility turns into being a counterfactual possibility, something that was once possible but that didn't occur. A necessary conclusion, and this is the model theory's alternate to validity, is a little complicated, at least complicated for me to explain, but I think it's what people spontaneously use. They think a conclusion describes at least one premise possibility, and it doesn't exclude any or refer to new ones. That point is important. So I should have said this earlier, but much of what we have to say in this talk has resonances from earlier talks in this meeting. If I were to be able, as I said before, <coughs> I reached the age of amnesia, to pick out all the uh, things in earlier talks that somehow are here, then that's all I would do for the next 20 minutes or so. So I apologize for not being able to give credit where credit is due. There is, and this point requires emphasis, an inference that is valid and an inference that is necessary given the premises, they overlap a lot. So modus ponens is a good example of an inference that's both valid and necessary. You can tell what's coming. There are necessary inferences, i.e. ones that people will accept that are not valid. So I tell you there's a triangle or a circle, and I say therefore it's possible that there's a triangle. Most people accept that. And uh, it's a perfect example of picking out a possibility that the premises raise and not excluding the other possibility. So people infer it. Uh, there's a very interesting phenomenon. I don't think anybody's mentioned it. Uh, the waiter says you can have wine or beer, 
So you think to yourself, if you're me, I dare say if you're Sonny and Ruth, oh, so I can have wine. Now, you saw earlier the true functional definition, the definition of or. This is not at all valid in logic. And this phenomenon has been known for about 80 years. And so there is an enormous literature by standards of our field, something like 700 papers, trying to explain why this uh, inference is so compelling. It's motivated, of course, to save logic. So I like Bryce, and you can attempt to, and people have, and somebody did cite the relevant paper earlier, uh, not in this context, uh, the idea that there are conventions of discourse which uh, can explain uh, inferences of this sort. I don't actually think this works, but I'm not going to tell you why. I also like Hamlet. I like the play. Act two, scene two, Hamlet says, nothing is either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. He doesn't mean or in the logical sense. He is uh, actually anticipating uh, the paradox of free choice permission in a way. He clearly means nothing is either good or bad, uh, means that if something is good, it's good because you think it's so. And if something is bad, it's bad because you think it's so. Of course, what he thought was bad was Denmark. Uh, so one of the things that's very important about possibilities, and this is something that uh, Marco Rani has evidence on, is if two possibilities are consistent, people will combine them into a single possibility. So here's a perfect example. You can have wine or beer. There are two possibilities there. But it doesn't... <laughs> I'm gesturing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I can never refuse a drink. <laughs> So uh, there are two possibilities, you condense them into one, into a conjunction. So this, we don't need any extra machinery uh, from what I've already told you to explain these sorts of uh, so-called paradoxes. Here's an example, uh, a few people, I've mentioned this earlier, a few people ate uh, steak or sole, so you would infer a few people ate, for example, ate steak. You won't make this inference if it's most people. And it's simply a question of whether you can combine both possibilities into one without contradiction, which you can easily do here. So people do, in fact, make this inference, uh, and they reject this inference. And you can see who is this sort of dutiful. Uh, both Julia Raska and uh, Christina Quellas are here somewhere. They will correct me if I can find them, but I can't see them. Uh, Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, again, this perhaps won't surprise you. There are also valid inferences that are not necessary. And so obviously, the model theory says people should reject them. I had the anesthetic or felt pain, but not both. Therefore, I had the anesthetic or felt pain or both. Does that look like a convincing inference? People reject it. But obviously, if the premise is true, then the conclusion is true. So it's valid. But it's not necessary. Why? Because nothing in the premise establishes, in fact, you might almost say it contradicts the idea that both should occur. So the premise doesn't support the possibility of both having the drug and feeling pain. So it's not necessary. It's introducing an additional possibility. Uh, the most famous example of this is if you know a proposition A, and it doesn't matter whether it's a simple atomic proposition or a compound or whatever, it follows therefore A or B or both. 
From that it follows that A or B or C or both. From that it follows therefore A or B or C or D, and so on ad infinitum. So a corollary of this, which is pretty obvious, is that from any premise whatsoever, any set of premises, a countable infinity of conclusions follow validly. So logic can never tell you what conclusion you ought to draw. In fact, most conclusions that follow from logic are as daft as a paintbrush, as we used to say in the orchard. They're silly. So if anybody ever tells you rationality is fundamentally due to logical reason, hit them with this argument. Most valid inferences are silly. Uh, people wouldn't draw them. So logic can't tell you what to conclude. Suppose you discover that the conclusion of a valid inference is false. What should you do to withdraw that conclusion? In logic, the answer is very simple. There's nothing you can do. So, absolutely nothing. There's no Gricean sort of defense at all. So here's an example. If a pilot falls from a plane without a parachute, then the pilot dies. The pilot fell from a plane without a parachute, so people will infer the pilot, therefore the pilot died. It's valid, it's necessary. And then you learn that in fact the conclusion is false. So what you want to do is to say, okay, I should add that uh, to the set of premises. And so instead of having the conclusion the pilot didn't die, uh, sorry, I have the, uh, instead of the conclusion I have the assertion the pilot didn't die. So now we have an inconsistent set of assertions. They can't all be true at the same time. And once you have an inconsistent set of assertions, in logic, in standard logic, you can draw any conclusion whatsoever including the wretched conclusion you just denied. So uh, you're up a uh, gum tree, basically. Um, so inconsistently, inconsistency validly implies any conclusion. At least one person in the audience knows what I'm about to tell you because they told me this during the course of the meeting. When somebody confronted Bertrand Russell with this rather unfortunate consequence, he said, yes, it's true. So the skeptic said, all right, prove from one plus one that I am the Pope. Sorry, one plus one equals one, uh, that I am Pope. So Russell, being quick-witted, said, well, you're one, and the Pope is one. One plus one equals one, so you and the Pope are one. <laughs> now. Uh, it's very ingenious, but it's got nothing to do with uh, standard logic. Uh, the point in standard logic is very simple. There can't be a counterexample. Why? Because a counterexample demands true premises, combined with a false conclusion. But you can't have true premises if they're inconsistent. By definition, they're false. And that's why uh, this unfortunate consequence occurs. So, so the assertions above don't just prove the conclusion you're trying to deny, they prove any conclusion you want, including that God exists. Uh, I can't resist telling you that Gödel used modal logic to prove that God does exist, uh, but somebody discovered the proof was flawed. Um, so inconsistency in logic is a catastrophe. There's a very interesting book compiled from notes by students who took Wittgenstein's course on the foundations of mathematics. And it also includes conversations with people in the audience. A, a, a regular attender was Turing. So the only dialogue that passed between those two great individuals that I've ever seen is in this book. And uh, one of the things that they discuss is precisely this. And you can tell that they're both incredibly frustrated by the fact that a very simple error has this catastrophic consequence. Well, let me tell you about the model theory of inconsistency. Inconsistency 
leads to the null model. And if you can join the null model with anything else, you get the null model. So inconsistencies have only local effects. So it, as it were, bypasses this consequence of logic. Now, what about people? Here's an inference again, the same one as before. I'll cut out the parachute business. If a pilot falls from a plane and the pilot dies, this pilot fell from a plane that did not die, why not? If you ask that sort of question, then people try to resolve the inconsistency, and they prefer a causal uh, account that does so, even if it's not minimal. Uh, so this is work that uh, I was involved in, uh, also the late Vittorio Giolotto, and more recently Sonny and I looked at it as well. So the sort of thing that people would say is the plane was on the ground and so he didn't fall far. Uh, this is a bit like the, the, you know, the unexpected event in a way. So you get some very interesting uh, consequences in this task. My favorite is the pilot was already dead. <laughs> <laughs> the last substantive part of this book concerns truth and verification. As I mentioned, in logics, there are just two truth values. Uh, they occur in the semantics, not in the language of proofs. So there's a strict segregation <laughs> there. Um, in real life, of course, we don't have this separation. So we can talk about truth and falsity. And in the vernacular, people say all sorts of extraordinary things concerning truth. I mean, the liar paradox is one. If you don't know what that is, I, I have to tell you, you have to find out, but I'm not going to tell you here. Uh, Yogi Berra is, was a great baseball player. And after Dr. Spooner, I think his way with natural uh, language was, was extraordinary. You probably come across some of his more famous, uh, I don't know what to call them, uh, bearisms. Uh, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> uh, my favorite is more than half the lies they tell about me aren't true. <laughs> now, of course, if you're a dedicated Gricean, you can see why that makes sense. Uh, Mary McCarthy, the Catholic novelist, had a feud with Lillian Hellman Actually, I think McCarthy was right. The evidence suggests so. Uh, and the feud was basically uh, encapsulated in a remark that Mary McCarthy made. She said, everything she writes is a lie, including uh, and and the. Actually, I think she said it's false, including and and the. Can you imagine trying to put that into a standard logic? It's impossible. Uh, I mentioned Orwell the other day, so I, uh, his views about uh, propaganda, all propaganda is lies, even when you're telling the truth. Um, so we've seen that observations create a fact and counterfactuals. Uh, how do we find out the truth of a counterfactual? Well, like any sort of assertion, there are lots of cases where it's impossible. And it's often impossible. I mean, uh, uh, I dare say you could deal with David Lewis's example of the kangaroo without tails top over. But the sort of, uh, if you've seen The Man in the Tall Tower or, or read Philip K. Dee's novel on it, the, the, the Nazis win, uh, and so on and so forth. And so you can easily construct counterfactuals on such things. So there's no real way in which you can verify them. Uh, in standard logic, I didn't mention this earlier, but it's worth pointing out, the, the semantics of truth and falsity isn't enough. You can't define possibly A in terms of the, the truth, truth value. So a standard semantics form, but it's not the only semantics, is to have possible worlds. Uh, think of a possible world as a, a small scale situation, except that every possible modal assertion that you might make in the real world is going to have a definite truth value uh, as, a, as a categorical assertion in some relevant possible world. And obviously they're vast. There's an infinite number of them. 
uh, in David Lewis's universe, I think it's even an uncountable infinity. I should mention a small footnote here. Um, I once had a two-hour conversation with David Lewis, and of course he was a very great metaphysician, he was a brilliant man. He believed that possible worlds, he took a realist view about them, so he thought they existed. And he wrote a letter to me uh, shortly after that, in which he said, of course, this sort of semantics is hopeless as psychology. So it's a very strange, almost paradox to me, that I, I suspect that the same was true of Kripke. If you read the preface to his book, Naming and Necessity, he realizes that possible worlds are far too big to be psychologically plausible. And he said, well, you only think about a little of them. And he actually called them mini worlds. So if I had a chance to talk to Kripke, I would have said, well, aren't they just sort of mental representations, small mental, I wouldn't say mental models, I don't get a his no to have that, but anyway. Uh, so uh, for the finite solution of how people decide whether counterfactuals are true or false, the place to go is games, sports. I spent quite a long time reading the rules of various sports. And it, it was quite staggering to me how many of them have counterfactual rules in them. Uh, golf has a counterfactual rule. Rugby has a counterfactual rule. But a game which is very complicated. Uh, I once had a conversation uh, with a guy that wrote Netherlands. Somebody here will know his name. Uh, what the hell is it? Joseph O'Neill. Is it? Something like right that. There, anyway. He, he and James Wood, a well-known Brit, lit Brit in the USA, were having a conversation, and I joined it. And I asked Joseph O'Neill, why do you think cricket is, is not played much here? Footnote, there's now a professional league of cricket in Texas. <laughs> and he said, the author, it's too complicated for Americans. <laughs> and I think it has the most complicated counterfactual rule. It's a double conditional, and I've <laughs> simplified it here. So for those of you that don't know the game of cricket, relax, you don't need to. All you have to understand <laughs> is if the ball hadn't hit the batsman, it would have hit the wicket, which is three bits of wood. Uh, and umpires have to make this judgment. By definition, it's a counterfactual. You can't observe it. So. Uh, they're pretty good. So now I'll attempt to... Uh, oh, we discovered it worked here. Um, no, it didn't. Uh, yeah. You might as well. <laughs> So the ball turns, I'll do it in slow motion for a moment, you'll see. <coughs> Jeff Goodman will tell you all about shame. Uh, so the umpire gives the batsman out, he thinks the ball is going to hit the wicket. Watch carefully, see how the ball turns off the pitch. It's a great leg break forward. And it hits the, the pads, hits the batsman without the bat. Okay, do you think it's going to hit the wicket or not? Hands up and say it's going to hit the wicket. Hands up, say it won't hit the wicket. It's pretty easy. <laughs> this is the uh, reconstruction by Hawkeye. You can see it misses the wicket. Hawkeye is a set of uh, cameras. I think the maximum they use is six. What they do is they reconstruct the trajectory of the uh, ball had the batsman not been there. It's a finite system. It operates fairly quickly. It's a very good model, I believe, of how human beings arrive at the truth value for certain sorts of counterfactuals. So, uh, how much time have I got left? Um, uh, two minutes now. No, as much as you want. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, 
you have had the two minutes that you you told me tell yes, me where you have to I should, I should but talk Bruno to you. was inviting you to keep uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe I should pause so those that want to leave can leave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll go on. We just go on. Uh, so imagine that there are two possible definitions that you could have arrived at. Uh, those are the only two possibilities, the mutually exclusive city A or city B, uh, they're comprehensive. And suppose you arrive at city A. In standard logics, the disjunction is true. And that's, I think, pretty plausible, and I don't reject it. But the question of interest is, do people consider the counterfactual possibility that they arrive at city B instead? So if they do, the way they would do so is they'd modify their model of reality to determine whether the counterfactual is true or false. And uh, what we've shown is that people do do that, and they do it in various circumstances, and they seem to do it spontaneously without us giving them a hint that they should. So we've done various sorts of experiments, but I'm going to just describe one. Um, this is an experiment in which we use a sort of truth value which is uh, entirely outside uh, standard logic. So you probably can't see this, but behind this town there's a little red car. Can you actually see that at the back? Okay. So you obviously arrive at that uh, city, and if you look, you, you see there's no reason why you couldn't have arrived at the other city. So the truth values that people choose in this case is it's true and it couldn't have been false because he could have got to the other city, right? And the, the area under the curve shows you how many people chose that particular uh, truth value. The verticals correspond to individuals uh, in terms of uh, how many of them. So the two are really dependent ways of uh, presenting the same results. So, in this case, you still arrive at City A, but you see that there's a barrier which they know means you can't get there. So now what they prefer is true, but it could have been false. Uh, you can see the curve there. I can go a little quicker now. Uh, the car is stuck behind the barrier, but it could have got to the other city, so it's false. But it could have been true if he'd taken the other road. And finally, you've got the worst case scenario. He's stuck behind the barrier to one town and couldn't reach the other. So it's false and it couldn't have been true. So the road not taken affects the truth values that people select. Here, of course, we're demanding that they think about counterfactual possibilities. In another experiment, we don't do that. We don't use these truth values you still see that the people do think about it. All right, conclusions. So this is the general situation that I've presented. There are necessary conclusions that follow in the model theory that are also valid. There are necessary conclusions that are not valid and people accept them. And there are valid conclusions that are not necessary and people reject them. So now the happy ending. So the model theory first of all, draws its own conclusions. It allows people to draw their own conclusions, unlike standard logics. And you can withdraw conclusions. As a matter of fact, I think that all inferences that have any empirical content at all, even albeit in tautologies, are defeasible in principle. You can change your mind and withdraw them without uh, contradiction. Inconsistencies have only local effects, because they lead to the null model, uh, and all that follows is the null model. So they tell you that something is wrong in the premises, but they don't imply uh, that God exists. Now, I know that there are people in this audience for whom logic is a touchstone. And uh, you have to remember that this doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you can't use logic. Uh, Frege, I think, was right about this, and it won't his books about arithmetic, he actually says, the laws of logic are not the laws of psychology. So as far as we being psychologists are interested in reasoning, we can say goodbye to logic.
Yeah. Well, should we go and get something to drink? <laughs> questions? If, you're, if people have questions. Yes, Mark. It was a very nice talk, but I'm still, now I have more questions than answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what? good. Yes, I know. That is why I'm saying Especially if you're writing a grant. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one of the questions is, is now model theory turning in the kind of normative account? Well, it has a normative account, yes. You should aim to draw necessary conclusions. But where is then the border between the descriptive part of model theory and the normative part? And Bet the difference between an intuitive model and a deliberative model. If you build a deliberative model without making a mistake, it's going to deliver a correct conclusion. Can we clearly decide what is a, a valid or, let's say, a correct or an incorrect inference? It's defining it. <coughs> so we have an algorithm that draws intuitive models, I mean, uh, uh, <coughs> that draws deliberative models. Uh, the deliberative model, in many cases, I would say syllogisms, uh, is giving you the same answer as logic. So we have to look for these cases. I mean, the, the case of something that is valid but not uh, necessary mm -hmm. is the A, therefore A, or B, or mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. And it's mark, a, a marked phenomenon that the people that defend it, including myself, uh, logic as a model a long time ago in the 70s, had to take great pains to block that inference because they knew that people would tend to reject it. Mm -hmm. Isabel Orenis, who's in the audience here, did a study showing that they hate that just as much as they hate the paradoxes of material implication. Isn't that, can I just, just a provocative statement? Of course. Isn't <laughs> that a way of turning a theory? Because you realize that people often make they often err, they make errors and yes. so on, and now I try to adapt the normative th theory in a way so that people uh, That could have been the that. history of it, but in fact the history mm -hmm. was not that. The history mm -hmm. was very simple. You think about what's going to go into a model if people are thinking rapidly. They won't represent what's false. Mm -hmm. But if you represent what's false as well, it will prevent you from combining things in erroneous ways. Mm -hmm. So, uh, no, the, the, it's, historically, it worked the other way around. I mean, what I think would be provocative, and I will confess this with apologies to Ruth and, and Sonny if I don't like it, we were very slow in realizing all this stuff. The thing you have to realize, psychology takes a hell of a long time for things that seem subsequently pretty obvious mm -hmm. uh, to be established in Peru. I think uh, Salvador has a question. Yep. <coughs> oh, oh, sorry. Uh, Salvador and then Mark. Yep. Uh, I wonder if you would agree with the following weakening of your conclusion. So from what you said before, as you pointed out, I think uh, entirely correctly, it is what you've been calling standard logic yes. that has these properties, pernicious, negative properties. So would you agree with the weakening of your conclusion that would be good by classical? Oh yes, I'm saying you would buy standard logic. I see. All right. Uh, yeah. I mean, just for those that aren't aficionados of logic, there are all sorts of extraordinary logics: uh, intuitionistic logics, uh, paraconsistent logics, logics that don't uh, are modals that don't use possible worlds. And I, I really, uh, I don't know. Though somebody may somewhere have published something that's maybe on site archive, but you know, we've looked. Shall we call a halt then? Yeah, we'll Okay. All right.